Well, brothers and sisters, we are heading on to part 12 of the nature and character of God. And uh, you have been, uh, most of you have been listening uh, or watching online over the past number of weeks. Um, and uh, I, I don't know about you, of course, but for me, I have learned an awful lot through this whole series. Um, and and someone has, well, a number of people have mentioned to me over the course of the sermon series that it's, it's challenging. There are, there are things that we are diving into that are, that are pretty deep. And, and that's very true. Whenever we try to understand God, um, we need to recognize, first of all, that we are going to rapidly get in over our heads. And secondly, we need to recognize that it's okay Indeed, it is expected that we will not be able to grab hold of everything that God is. It's just not possible for us. The Bible tells us very clearly in a number of different, uh, number of different ways throughout the scriptures that God's ways are far above our ways, that his ways are not our ways. And, and talks to us a number of different times about how basically we will really not ever be able to fully comprehend God. That being said, as I hope has been clear throughout uh, our sermon series, there are things that we can learn about who God is. Because yes, God is so far above us in certain ways, but also we believe in a God who reveals himself. A God who teaches us about himself. And we learn that in a number of different ways. Of course, the primary way in which we learn about who God is, is through scriptures, through the Bible. But also we learn about who God is through creation, through nature. We can see that all the heavens declare his praise, that God flung the stars into space, that he knows them all by name. God is a God who has created everything, and so everything that we see proclaims who he is. But we also learn about God through uh, our fellow believers, brothers and sisters in Christ who are faithful and, and who are also on the same journey that we are, the journey to learn about God and to follow him and serve him and love him and to love others as well. And so godly counsel given by fellow believers is another way in which we learn about God. Biblically, historically, and also now today, we also learn about God through visions and through miracles and through speaking in tongues and other gifts of the Spirit. There are so many ways in which we learn about God. Anyways, today we are going to learn about God's infinity. God's infinity. And as always, we're going to look briefly at this diagram that was provided to us by Karen Sori uh, from the Infographics Bible. She allowed me to create it. And I know that uh, you're probably tired of hearing that particular line, but um, it's all copyright friendly. So we want to continue to give credit where credit is due. But as we look at this diagram, do we have the diagram, David? Uh, oh, ah, I forgot. David gave me the remote. Um, so, yeah. Oh, well, you saw it there for a second. Oh, PowerPoint. Oh, Ooh, yeah. Oh. Well, anyways, <laughs> as we look at the diagram and we zoom in to see um, God's infinite nature, uh, we also want to take a moment to look at the scriptures. And, and this is a little bit weird. We don't traditionally do this in our church, but we, uh, there are lots of other churches that do this. They stand while they're reading scriptures. And so I'm going to invite you to stand. You've got uh, hardly any other times during the service where you can. If you're not 
unable or not comfortable to stand, then, then don't. That's totally fine. But let us uh, look at the scriptures and see what they say. This is uh, actually from Revelation chapter 22, or Revelation chapter 20. Uh, 22 verse 7? 13? <laughs> Good job, Pastor Dan. <laughs> So prepared. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. Not from Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Jesus says to the churches, he says, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Now, uh, that particular passage, there are two things in there that really stand out. Of course, there is this sort of threefold repetition of how God is basically the beginning and the end. And that's sort of where we'll focus for the majority of this message. However, there is also the, the reality in the beginning where Jesus says, look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. I will reward each according to what they have done. And, and like always, this is one of those passages that could be potentially confusing for the Christ follower. Because on the one hand, throughout the scriptures, uh, we have this idea that, uh, that salvation, in other words, eternal life granted to us by God, is not, so much not, like capital N-O-T, not, something we earn. It is not something we can achieve. It is given to us by grace alone through Jesus Christ and through his sacrifice on the cross. But then we come across passages like this. And then we say, well, wait, wait a second. Jesus Christ is going to reward us for what we have done? Does that mean that we're going to be punished for what we've done as well? That seems to make sense. Like, what is going on here? Is salvation a free gift of God, or is it something that we earn? The answer is that salvation and Scripture, we have to interpret Scripture always within the light of Scripture. The answer is that salvation is very definitely a free gift of God given through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can ever change that. It is also true that God does pay attention to what we do. God does reward people who obey him and do good. We don't know exactly what that looks like. But Jesus tells us very clearly in the Gospels that we are to build, invest in the kingdom of God, build up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. That we are to do good things things in his name and through the power of the Holy Spirit and that that will be building up treasures in heaven. The Bible also talks to us about uh, getting a crown of glory for the deeds that we do here on earth. It also talks to us about how some people will arrive at the pearly gates as it were, arrive at heaven as if they had just escaped from fire with themselves singed, as it were. The reality is, is that you can be saved. You can have accepted what Jesus offers. And then you can be... You cannot invest in the kingdom as much as you potentially could have. So that you, you get to the pearly gates, but you're kind of smoking 
and not because you're hot, but because you, you just made it. God's grace is given to you. You are welcomed into the kingdom. But maybe you didn't share the gospel with anybody ever. Or, or, or maybe you, you, you didn't give generously. Or maybe you didn't help people. Or maybe, maybe none of those things. Or, you know, maybe, maybe you're a little bit like the thief on the cross who lived his whole life in ignorance and darkness and who finally received salvation at the very end of his life. And if it were possible for him to have regrets, I bet you one of his regrets would be that he didn't have more time to invest in the kingdom of God. That he finally learns the great and glorious truth that God loves him with total and complete abandon and that God sent his very son to save him and that God God has been calling him all along, but it is only now as he is about to die that he finally learns the truth. He finally listens to God's call. He's so thankful for that. But he's probably also thinking, oh, I need, I, I gotta tell people, I gotta help people, I gotta share the gospel, I gotta, oh no, there's no time left. Part of the moral of this little passage is a positive one and part of it's a negative one. The negative is don't be a bench warmer. Don't be a pew warmer. Don't just sit on the sidelines of the gospel. God has given each and every one of us a mission. And performing that mission of loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And loving our neighbor and making disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded. That mission, that mission is yours and yours and mine. And no one should be sitting on the sidelines. That's part of, the, part of the moral of that. Don't sit on the sidelines. And the positive, of course, is then do get out and play the game to extend, <clears throat> extend the metaphor a bit more. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't have COVID-19. <coughs> I just swallowed my spit the wrong way. You know why I think that is? I had new teeth. Huh? See, I'm not missing teeth. <coughs> but it's actually not teeth. It's actually a tooth. A uh, really long one. And so my mouth is different. <coughs> Anyways, excuse me. So um, we don't want to, we do want to get out there and play the game. We want to take the adventure that God has in store for us. The adventure of sharing the good news. All right. We need to move on. <clears throat> there are three ways in which God is infinite in his nature. Three ways in which God is infinite in his nature. Uh, one way, and we're going to focus on only one of them. One way is that God, uh, God has infinity with regards to time. Okay, we've talked about this uh, already. God has infinity with regards to time. God created time, and so God transcends time, right? It's like the artist and the painting. Imagine I'm an artist painting time, right? I do not become part of the painting. I am outside of the painting. I may have created the painting. I did create the painting, but I'm not in the painting, right? In the same way God created time, he's not He's not bound by time. He transcends time. That's a, a long one and it's a big one. But that is 
uh, that is part of what our passage is getting at this morning, right? He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, right? He is the first and the last. And even that does not quite fully get at it because we believe totally that God, God, though he is the beginning and the end, he has no beginning or end, right? He is the one who started everything and he is the one who will finish anything, but everything, but he himself has no beginning, no end. He was not created by anyone. He's not going to be destroyed by anyone. He is, period. Yeah? Second is that God is immense. Immense. Right? And, and we've talked about this already as well. God is everywhere at once. God is omnipresent. There is nowhere that God is not. And this is, this is so significant too, right? Right? Remember, we talked about how we have this tendency to think that there's a private space up here, that we can think all our things and that no one will know. Uh, but that's not true. God knows. God is everywhere, right? Uh, secondly, or lastly, and this is the one that we're really going to focus on this morning, God is infinitely who God says he is. God is infinitely true to God's character. God has what theologians would call absolute perfection. When we learn, for example, that God is holy, we must understand that God is totally, completely, infinitely holy. There is no way in which God is not holy. There is no tiny portion of God that is not perfectly holy. God is infinite, absolute in his character. And that is really important for us. It is really important for us because we know that we can rely on God. Oh, sorry. First, we should go at why we know this. <laughs> yeah. Why do we know that God is absolutely perfect in his character and in his nature. We know this because of who God calls himself, who God testifies that he is. He says to Moses, when Moses asks him, who shall I say sent me to the Israelites, right? You remember the burning bush. Moses says, who do I say sent me, right? And God says to him, I am. I am. God is the being who is totally and absolutely, truly who he says he is. I am. There is no hint of darkness or lie within him. When God says through the scriptures that God is love, that is absolutely, infinitely, totally true. So we know this because of who God names himself to be. I am. We also know this because we see the evidence throughout scriptures. There are some Christians who are tempted to sort of ignore the Old Testament and to focus on the New Testament, but that is not, that is not okay. The Bible says very clearly that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when we look at the Old Testament and we look at the New Testament, we are looking at the same God. And if we are careful, and if we look at those things carefully, we see that indeed God is absolutely consistent in his character. And if there's ever a point where we think, oh, that doesn't seem consistent, the problem is with us, not with God. Right? But we can see the evidence of God's character throughout the scriptures, and it is always the same. And we can see the evidence of God's, God's character in our own lives, too. In our own experience. 
We know, thirdly, as I mentioned, that God declares that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And we know this last of all and most significantly because the very living word of God came to be with us and to be one of us. And this, of course, is referring to Jesus Christ, but it's also referring to the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Jesus is, just like God is infinitely who God declares himself to be, so too the Son, Jesus Christ, is infinitely who he declares to be. Jesus says very clearly in the scriptures that anyone who has seen him has seen the Father. And from now on, when the disciples question him about this, he says, from now on, you have seen the Father because you have seen me. And Jesus himself declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if Jesus is the very perfect reflection of who God the Father is, then we know who God is because we see who God is in Jesus and we see that he is consistent as well. He is infinitely good. He is infinitely holy and perfect. He is infinitely righteous. Jesus is our first witness to who the Father is. In a like manner, the the Holy Spirit comes to live within us and testifies to us as well about who God is. Because the Holy Spirit is also infinitely who the Holy Spirit is says he is. So, what does that mean for us? Once again, I don't know about you, but once again, we're kind of going, whoa. Because for you and I, that is so not the case. I like to think that I am an honest, truthful person. But if I examine myself honestly, I know that I am not 100% infinitely, totally, absolutely honest all the time. I'm not even honest with myself a lot of the time. And I am very confident that you also are in the same boat. And that is true about everything else, too. Think of those Ten Commandments, right? God did not want Israel simply to obey the Ten Commandments. What God really wanted was God wanted internal, total, and complete transformation so that every part in every way was always fulfilling and living by the spirit of those commandments. That's how he is. That's how God is. God doesn't contemplate murder because God is not murderous. There is no part of him that is. God does not contemplate doing evil because he's not evil. There's no part of him that is. God is 100% totally, completely, exactly who he says he is. And so I stand in awe. Because that is mind-blowing. That someone, some being, could be so totally and completely who they claim to be. But also... This helps to reinforce the reality that I can rely on God. That you can rely on God. Right? You, 
I'm sure we have all felt it from time to time where someone we know or love or trust or whatever has behaved in a way that doesn't seem to fit with their character. That's not who you are. I, I know that has happened to me, right? Why did you do that? Why did you behave that way? That's not the you that I know. That's not the you that I love. But that's never going to happen with God. I can rely on God because he really, truly is the same the ye yesterday, today, and forever. And so can you. But then, of course, we have to ask the question, how does that make a difference for how we are to live? In, in this lifetime, and, and truth be told, because we are limited, finite beings, we will never be totally and completely who we say we are in the same way as God is, because he's so much infinitely greater than we are. However, we can and are encouraged to and are called to and through the power of the Spirit and growing and maturing, we are called to be more who... God has called us to be. More honestly who God created us to be. More honestly who Jesus redeemed us to be. More truly the, the recreated, born again people that God called us to be. We see throughout scriptures, I only listed a couple of examples here, that there is a call for us to be genuine. To be really and truly and honestly you. Right? Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more comes from evil or comes from the evil one. God says to us, look, don't get all fancy and flowery with your language. Don't swear by heaven or by earth or anything under the earth. Don't swear. Just say yes or no and say Stick with it. Do it. Be true to your word. What you say ought to mean something. Be genuine. Be true. Proverbs 24, uh, 27 verse 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And this gets whole, to the whole lack of genuineness. Right? Enemies will flatter you. Enemies will pretend they love you. Enemies will, will not tell you the hard truth sometimes. They'll just be like, yeah, hey, you're great. And then, wow, she's so mean to, behind your back. But a true friend, a genuine friend, just like God, will say to you, hey, look. You need to change this. This is not okay. Your behavior is abominable here. A true friend will give you wounds that can be trusted. Whereas an enemy will just say, No, it's good. You're great. Yeah. And so too... We need to be true friends. We need to be truthful and honest. And we need to grow into more and more the genuine character that God has called us to have. This is part of the glory and wonder of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. That because of him, the law that we looked at earlier this morning is transformed from an obligation that weighs us down with guilt and, and with sin known to us. It's transformed from that into, because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit, an opportunity for me to truly be free from all the sin. <clears throat> Not that that journey will be complete in this lifetime. But it is there. And we are on that journey. Nonetheless. For that is God's desire for us. That we would be holy. 
as he is holy. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for giving us your son Jesus to show us totally and completely who you are. And thank you so much for who you are. For your complete and total nature and character. And even though, oh God, we can only ever scratch the surface of who you are, we are grateful that you are infinitely and totally and absolutely who you claim to be. Help us, O oh God, to continue to stand in awe of that. Help us, O oh God, to rely on you because we know some portion of who you are. And help us, O oh God, to more truly reflect in our daily lives in all of our being the reality of who you have recre recreated us to be through Jesus. May we be holy just as you are holy. In Jesus name. Amen. What we will invite you to contem contemplatively uh, hum along or prayerfully uh, think along uh, with our song of response, uh, which this morning is uh, Be Unto Your Name. And let us give glory to God as we consider and pray.